Thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to know how God is using this ministry to touch your life. So please tell us how God is moving in your life by going to our website at www.christian.life. We're in a series called Climate Change. Culture is shifting rapidly, and in today's world, it seems as if nothing is sacred anymore. In this series, we're gonna discuss how the moral erosion has taken place and what we can do to play our part in advancing the kingdom of God. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy today's message. Good morning. We're talking about climate change, and I'm doing a play on words, right? I'm not talking about ozone deterioration. I'm talking really about the moral erosion that we're beginning to see in our nation. And if you're paying attention, you know that things are changing quickly, and for the most part, not for the better. Would you agree? And, And so in a single generation, We've seen just this radical shift from Christian values. And, and, you know, in part it's due to technology, but in the end of the day, things aren't going all that well, okay? Now, this isn't a negative series. We're going to talk about what we can do to make a difference for the positive. But to illustrate my point that things are changing, I want to tell you about the difference between my parents' concerns and my concern as a parent today, right? And, And so were my parents concerned with sexual activity, Absolutely. But I don't think they were worried about it being so casual that I would have friends with benefits, right? They, they certainly weren't worried about me sexting. If you don't know what sexting is, this is young people sending naked pictures of themselves to other young, I'm hoping it's young people, by the way, I don't know. And, and so, but, but, you know, it didn't exist because, well, there was no internet, right? And, and so that's just one of the things. And, and some people are like, younger people are like, pastor was born before internet? Yeah. But you know what? Because there was no internet, there was no such thing as child predators that can uh, look at, go after our teens and pretend to be a teenage girl luring our sons into meeting places where they have intention of doing bad things. Uh, Were we concerned or were my parents concerned with porn exposure? I imagine that they were, uh, but, but they... For us to get it, we would have had to find a magazine and hide it or a video, and it just wasn't real convenient. You know, today, all a kid's got to do is pull this out, and about 15 seconds can be in some really, really dangerous stuff. And so we went to a Kirk Cameron movie uh, one-night event thing a couple of weeks ago. My wife and I did. It was called Connect, and it was talking about the dangers of the internet today, and they threw this statistic at me that's been haunting me kind of every since. It said, the average exposure to porn today, are you ready for this? It's eight years old. Eight years old. And let's not just roll over that number and say, well, that's not our kids. Let's let that disturb us a little bit, and let's make sure we're doing everything to protect our kids. Amen? You know, I know my parents weren't worried about me being abducted and sold as a sex slave. I mean, did that happen? I imagine it did, but human trafficking wasn't even a term then. And you know, drugs and alcohol, sure, they were concerned, and for good reason. But it's not like today where these kids can go into a, a, a schoolyard and, and be handed any number of prescription pills. Do you know that the number of teens using prescription pills is on the rise to the degree that in the last 30 days, not just ever, in the last 30 days, one in six teens have used prescription drugs for recreational purposes. And so we're trending in the wrong direction. You know, are my parents concerned about me getting in a fight at school? Yeah, because I got in a bunch. But they weren't worried about me getting shot, right? And, and so today, these are the things that we're dealing with. And the answers that we're coming up with to solve them, at least the answers that the world's coming up with, aren't working. Would you agree? And so the solution for guns, well, we need to legislate, right? I mean, and come on, how, when has that ever worked? 
Did legislating alcohol in the roaring 20s do any good? Right? I heard someone say this week, he, he said that a gun is responsible to kill someone as a pencil is for a spelling error. Right? But here's the thing. When you don't have a nation with a moral compass and a biblical worldview, what you're left with is legislation. And so what Chesterton said is, if men will not live by the Ten Commandments, they will live by 10,000 commandments. And that's what we're looking at today. And so we've got to have the answers as the church. They have to come from us because they're not going to come from the world. Let me just say this. I've said it before at the beginning, and I'll say it again. I'm not trying to get political with this. The gun thing wasn't a political shot. It just, come on, we got to use some common sense when we're talking about this stuff, and we're lacking it today. If you want to talk about school shootings in the school, it's because you got little dudes that are angry, and they had been very, very frustrated, primarily because of the breakdown in the home. And we're going to talk about that more as we get into this series. But can we all agree the world is a more dangerous place than it was a generation ago? And I want you to hear me, I'm not down on America, okay? We, we are the freest nation statistically in the history of the world. And if from my standpoint, freest equals greatest, period. We are the greatest nation in the history of the world. And, and so a couple of weeks ago, I went to Cuba, and that's a long story, I'll explain it later. But they're a communist nation, and supposedly they have religious freedom. And you know what I found? That's exactly what it is. It's freedom to be religious, if you want to burn incense and chant, they don't have a problem with it. But if you want to start proclaiming Jesus Christ, you want to start talking about getting filled with the Holy Spirit, you want to start talking about the cross and the power of it, listen, they'll shut that down. Over 100 churches got shut down a couple of years ago in Cuba, and they just destroyed them, just wiped them out, because they got spies in the churches. And if they hear things they don't like, they begin to take action. And we live in a nation, church, where we've got the opportunity to reach people without fear of, of persecution, without fear of the government getting involved, at least today. Ronald Reagan was right. He said, freedom is never more than a generation away. But today, we have that freedom. But how many of you know we got some issues? How many of you know God's bigger than your biggest issue? Praise the Lord. And so the divorce rate in America today is about 50%. 50%, that's staggering. It's been there for about 10 or 20 years. Nothing's changed. It just still continues to be half of marriages don't work. You know how much time I spend worrying about divorce? None. None. Now, I'll tell you this. When, when I was at my first year of marriage, I wondered how I was going to get to two. That was a real big concern. But Jesus came in in between one and two. And today we're at 21, and I don't worry about how I'm going to get to 22. I don't worry about how I'm going to get to 50. I'm going to get there, okay? Short of Jesus coming back, and, and I'm all for that. That's great. We could celebrate our 50th in heaven. But short of that, or me just absolutely refusing to eat vegetables, we're going to get to our 50th anniversary. <laughs> My wife's on that vegetable thing. I need you to pray for me. She's feeding me stuff, church, that just, it's not right. You know, I understand that tomorrow's not guaranteed for any of us, right? But I'll tell you this, if we don't hit 50, it'll be because death did us part. It won't be. I promise you it won't be because some chick enticed me to pull away from the love of my life, right? And so you say, how, how can you be so sure? Half of them are failing. What makes you so special? Listen, I don't play by their rules. Church, we don't have to play by the rules of the world. Okay, my marriage is founded on the rock of Christ Jesus and things that are built on the rock stand, period. But we do have problems. And here's what I want to tell you this morning, that as the church, we got to take some responsibility for that. Who are we going to blame, the world? Sin or sin, that's what they do. Job description, sinner, sin. So how can we say it's their fault? Chuck Colson said that culture is just the church incarnate. And, and to explain to you what he meant by that, I want you to tell you a story. I was in India in, in 2010 for the first time. And, and so we went to a hotel at night after a very long day of travel. We not only flew all the way to the nation, but we drove all the way across the country, or practically all the way across the country. And we got to a hotel shortly before dinner, and we were tired. And apparently, they gave me some instructions when I checked in that I wasn't paying attention to. See, they handed me this key, like an old-fashioned key to open a door, and then attached to the ring was a card. Now, I'm used to cards to open hotel rooms. I'm used to keys to open hotel rooms. 
I'm not used to both. I just figured I'll figure it out. Okay, well, what it turns out is when you go into your room, you slide the card into a slot, and it's for energy conservation. And so if you leave the room, you got to take your card, and within five minutes, the lights turn off. But I didn't know that. So I come in, and what you got to do is you got to use the key to lock yourself in and put the key in the slot. But I didn't put the key in the slot. I threw it on a drawer. And I went and I laid down. In about five minutes, the lights turned off. What I didn't notice when I walked into that room is there was no windows. And there was also like this... Um, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's blocking the foot of the door, uh, threshold. And so the door was up to the threshold. There was not an ounce of light in the room, okay? I, I'm talking, when the Bible talks about hell being a place of outer darkness, I know what they're saying because of this experience. And I'm laying on the bed, I'm in pitch black, and I realize that I was so tired when I came in, I don't even know which direction the door is. I know it's opposite my bed, but I don't know where it is. So I feel around by the bed, and I find the light switch. Praise the Lord, and I flip it, and nothing happens. And so I start walking. As I start walking, I hit my shins into a table. And then I figure the safest thing is going to be to get on all fours. So I get on all fours, and I get to the wall, and I climb up the wall, and I'm hitting pictures and everything else. And I go into one side, no door. I go to the other side, there's the door. I find the handle, praise the Lord, and I'm locked in because I need the key to get out. <laughs> and if you've ever been in a situation like this, like if you're a person who struggles with prayer, Right there, man, you don't really struggle with prayer anymore, right? And so it was getting all Pentecostal up in that room, you know? I'm praying in tongues. I'm, God, you got to help me. I'm going to die. And so I'm looking everywhere. And, and finally, you know, the Holy Spirit just came on me. And I remembered that the door was on that, uh, the key was on that uh, table that I ran into. And so I crawled over to the table. I found it. I went to the door, unlocked it. I was expecting a power outage. And the lights are on in the hallway. So I go down to the front desk saying, what in the world's going on? on and I get re-educated on how the pad works. And so, you know, but during that whole experience, and I'll tell you, man, there was lots of prayer. I'll tell you what, man, I, I, I never, if you told me about that situation, I'd tell you I'd be fine, calm, cool, collected. I was not calm, cool, collected. I was getting ready to freak out. And the girl I was with uh, in, in her room, one of the girls on our trip, she did freak out, completely panicked, and it's a scary situation. But, but I'll tell you, there was never a time when I was praying that I said, oh, Lord, would you just remove this darkness? What I was saying was, Lord, would you bring the light? Because light's not defined by darkness. Darkness is defined by light. Isn't that right? By definition, darkness is the absence of light. And so what Colson was saying when he said that culture is the church incarnate is that if there is not light shining in our world, it's because we are not providing it. Jesus said that we are the light of the world. And if this world has any hope, and hear me, they do, then it's going to have to come from us. Amen. And so if we're going to see climate change for the better, that reform, has to, that reform has to start right here. Mother Teresa challenges us or challenged us to be the change that we want to see in the world. And so the series isn't fixating on how bad things are but how we, with the help of the Holy Spirit, could turn this thing around. And how many of you know we can turn this thing around? Come on, God's arm is not short. We know that the latter grain is going to be better than the greater, or greater than the former rain, but we've got to be on board, and we've got to be doing our part. And so before we crack open the Word of God, let's pray. God, we know that. We know the latter rain will be far superior to the former rain. Your Holy Spirit is going to do an incredible thing in this world. The only question is, are we going to be involved and take part in what you're doing? And God, I pray that you commission us right now in Jesus' name, God, to take our stand for the faith, to stand for righteousness, and to share the love of Christ without fear, with boldness to this generation. And God, let it happen for your glory. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. 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 So the first step of recovery is realizing you got a problem, right? And we got to realize we got a problem in the church today. If you have your Bibles, we're going to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul addresses the problem. This is what he says in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Now I'm going to summarize this first verse and then we're going to read the rest of it right through, okay? But we got to stop right here. That word perilous means in threat of imminent danger or destruction. So Paul said there would come a day when, when the world and different societies would be at the point where they were in threat of imminent destruction if something didn't change. Now he said when that would happen would be the last days. The biblical definition of the last days is be, 
the time period between the ascension of Jesus Christ to the second coming, okay? But then the Bible talks about the very last days. And, and that's the time just before Jesus returns to earth. Now, Paul had to have been talking about that time because for the former last days, he was in that period. The ascension had already happened. Are you following me? And this is what he said would happen. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, Paul said, we better turn away. Now here is the scary thing about this verse. And here's what I want you to hear this morning. He wasn't talking about what the condition of the world would be. He was talking about what the church would look like. You say, how am I getting that? He said, having a form of godliness. The world doesn't care about having a form of godliness. He said they'll be unholy. Of course, the, the world is unholy. Apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, our righteousness is found in him alone. The world always looks just like this says. The world's always selfish. The world's always looking out for number one. But what Paul's saying is that the time before Christ returns, the church is going to start looking a whole lot like the world. And how many of you know that's where we're at today? And so if you have your sermon notes, I'd love for you to pull them out. and We're going to talk about what we can do about it. How, how do we influence? The question for today is how do we influence an unstable climate? Well, we got to quit viewing the world as a problem, right? I, I think it has to begin with that. You know, the difference between uh, military warfare and Christian warfare is that military warfare seeks to destroy the enemy, and Christian warfare seeks to win the enemy. And so we got to understand there's a difference. we got to understand that they're counting on us. And so what I want to do with the time remaining is as we look at your outline, I want to compare and contrast two men from the Old Testament. And they were both living in a day that was morally depraved. They were both immersed in that type of a culture, but they also both had a powerful anointing and calling upon their lives. One of them rose above it, but the other one joined in to the culture and eventually was killed by it. And I'm talking about the difference between Daniel and Samson. And so if you have your sermon notes um, point one is we need to refuse to compromise. If we're going to influence an unstable climate, we have to refuse to compromise. Let me say this. Nothing extinguishes our ability to shine quicker than compromise. Would you agree with that? And, and so let's look at how Daniel responded to the opportunity before him to compromise. It's in Daniel 1.8. Now, Daniel is in Persia. Daniel's a slave. He's an exceptional slave. He's been promoted in, into the king's service. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not, that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, listen, how easy would it have been for Daniel to compromise? Look, Lord, I got to eat. I'm all for the Hebrew dietary restrictions, but that's not what these folks eat. And if I don't eat, I'm going to die. And, and so, and they drink wine. I, I, I know you say don't drink, but I, I, this is what I got to do. And, and, but see, Daniel wasn't looking to blend in. He wasn't, the term I use is a Christian chameleon. We just adapt to our environment. Daniel wasn't that. He would stand out. And he did this risking his life. Now, now let's look at Samson. And, and as I talk about Samson today, listen, God used Samson in a mighty way. He was anointed of God. And, and I know I'm using him as a negative example today because, well, in, in a lot of ways he was. But he was a mighty man of God. And he was used to execute judgment upon nations um, all by himself. But anyway, Judges 14, 1 through 3, it says, Samson went down to Timnah, and he saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Okay, so this is before Delilah. This is his first pagan woman. And so he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I've seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get, get her for me as a wife. And then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all the people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. The Israelites were forbidden from marrying foreign women. And Samson is just a man who is driven by his impulses like a wild animal. 
There's another time where he throws this party. And when you translate the word for the party, it's revelry. This is alcohol. This, this is all sorts of not good things, right? And so Samson was born under a vow not to drink. And did he break that vow? Well, we don't know for sure. But I'll tell you this, that I'm someone who's made a vow not to drink. Not for any other reason other than I can't drink responsibly. So God removed it from my life. I've tried to drink since then, and it just doesn't end well. So we just got rid of it, said, well, never have another ounce in my life. Now, what are the odds that I would throw a kegger? I mean, that wouldn't even make any sense, right? And so we can assume, we can assume that, that, that Samson, Samson was participating in that as well and broke his vow. We don't know that for sure. But, but how do believers defile themselves today? Well, a lot of the same ways, drug use, drunkenness, illicit sex. But how many of you know our entertainment? Man, the things that we're doing today in the name of entertainment, church, we got to wake up. I, I've got this little vendetta against Hollywood right now. I, I'm just going on strike. You know, I, I'm just telling you, because I did some research. I went to family-friendly movies, whatever, plugged in, I guess they call it. And, and I just went on, and I wanted to see why movies are rated PG-13 or higher. And, and do you know that they use the Lord's name in vain, according to my research, about 90% of the time in PG-13 movies? Why is that necessary? What, what does that have to do with a plot of a movie? You know what I think? I think it's we're going to throw this in your face, and you're going to come and pay us money so we can blaspheme your God. That's what I think we're dealing with. And, and so my kids um, like video games. My boys do anyway. And so a couple of years ago, they had one of these violent video games. I don't like violent video games. So I went and I did some research. And my research tells me that this game, they cuss. And I'm like, what? The, the game cusses? And so I go down to my son, who happened to be playing it at the time. And I said, Nate, what the heck, man? I'm reading that this game cusses. He says, yeah, they do. And I said, well, what are you doing playing? He says, I got the volume down. I don't want to hear that. I'm like, but they're, what are they cussing for? I mean, look, we had video games in my day. Look, I cussed Miss Pac-Man out, but she never cussed me back. <laughs> Just saying. You know, we, we laugh, but how crazy is that? Video games, profanity on video, and it's nuts. You know, our taxes are coming due this week. And so believers are going to be tempted to claim things that they're not entitled to claim. And so I came to faith 19 years ago and came convicted under Larry Burkett's ministry that, man, I cheated on my taxes, and I cheated good, like a couple thousand dollars I, I received that I shouldn't. And so I went to my accountant, and I said, look, I, this isn't right. I, I, you know, I did this, and I was a crook, and you know, I, I just I need to pay the money back. And he says to me, Barry, he said, you got a log here. He says, they can never prove you didn't do this. I said, look, I didn't say I was a dumb crook. I just said I was a crook, <laughs> and we need to make it right. You know, and he gives me all this grief. And I said, look, I'm paying you to redo my tax return, redo my tax return, which he did. And I promptly fired him. And so I have a, a, an accountant today who does my business taxes. And listen, I tried to pull anything shady with her. I'm telling you, she called me to the carpet in an instant, okay, because she doesn't want to be associated with a company that's doing things shady. Years ago, Bill Scott's uh, our attorney for real estate and business affairs, I was, I was setting up a corporation for my business. And so I, I didn't know how the stock worked. You know, I thought you had to have a majority stockholder. And so my wife and I are going to partner, right? And, and so I thought someone had to have 51% of the stock. It was an honest mistake, seriously. And so I, I, as Bill says, how do you want to split the stock? I said, 51% for me, since I'm president, 49% for Cheryl. He says, whoa, whoa, you looking to get a little leverage there? Like, what do you mean? He says, why not 50 50? I said, you could do that. He said, you can do that. And I recommend you do. These are the people I want to do business with. How about you? You know, I had a, a boss years ago. His name was John, owned the last company I worked for. A wonderful man of God. He, he really was. But we had this guy in our unit, that, or in our um, office, that was his friend, and he was a salesman. And let's just say that his moral compass didn't always point north. And so he's doing some, like, shady stuff. And, and so I thought, man, if John knew about this, boy, he'd throw him out of here so fast. And then I realized in a meeting one day, John did know. And in the name of prophets, he was just looking the other way. And I still like him to this day, but that day he lost my respect. And come on, church, when we compromise, that's what happens, right? When we compromise, we lose the respect from people in this world. 
There's no such thing as sin management, right? We are going to master sin or sin is going to master us. We have to eradicate it, period. We all have areas of temptation, right? Yours might be pills, porn, or potluck. But we got areas that tempt us. But I want to tell you this morning, Tony Evans was right when he said, the cost of compromise is too high for low living. And that's what it is. Doing things in a way that doesn't honor God is just low living. The church today has lost its passion for Jesus. You know, this is our biggest compromise. They just look at us and they don't see us all fired up. John Eldred said this, modern evangelism read, or, or evangelicalism reads more like an IRS 1040 form. All the data is there, it just doesn't take your breath away. And how many of you know if you take your stand for Christ, everyone's not going to like it? We had this guy, I was stationed in, in the Air Force in Germany and had this guy, nicest guy you'd ever meet in your life. And I've been in the unit about two weeks. I'm just so impressed with this man's character. And then one day we're playing cards, and, and, and some of the guys playing cards say, oh, man, look at Tom. He thinks he's holier than thou. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, well, before you got here, about a month before you got here, he got saved. And, and so now he can't drink with us. And, and then I found out he had this beautiful German girlfriend who still hung around our unit because she had made so many friends. And I mean beautiful, okay? And, and she broke up with him because he wouldn't sleep with her. And, and so they're like, can you believe that? Who would do that? And I'm thinking, man, I'm living just the way they are, mind you. But I'm thinking any fool can get drunk and sleep around, and most fools do. This man's taking a stand. He's not sleeping with that chick. I mean, I got to tell you, as an 18-year-old young man, that had an impression on me. That, that spoke volumes to me. And so the way we live speaks louder than anything else, but we got to realize that the light, it's either going to attract or repel people, but it's going to have an impact. Okay, and we got to be willing to, to, if that illumination pushes people away from us, we got to be willing to let them go. That's what the cost of Christ says. But shine we must. We simply can't afford to compromise. There's too much at stake. Exemplify excellence. Uh, instead of reading these, I'm going to summarize for, for the sake of time. Daniel, it was said of him, he had an excellent spirit. In fact, in Daniel 6, 3, it says that the king sought to set him over the entire realm of the kingdom. In other words, he was going to go from a slave to second in command. How many of you know you got to be pretty good to go from a slave to second in command? It's what Joseph did as well. So Judges tells us a story of how uh, our, our friend Samson comes across a woman by the name of Delilah. So this is his second pagan woman. And he didn't even bother marrying her. But by the text, we can be pretty sure she was a friend with benefits. And so the Philistines set to destroy Samson. And so they set a trap for him. And the word of God says that she pestered him daily with her words and she pressed him until his vexed his soul. And so what he did was he told her the secret of where his strength came. And as a result, it cost him his life. And so for a man of such extraordinary physical strength, you got to say that Samson had a really weak constitution. He wasn't excellent. He was careless. And how many of you know there's just something appealing about people who do things with excellence? Isn't that right? Now, I'll tell you this. Sometimes we, we pushed it too far. I remember a decade or so ago, that was the, the kind of the catchphrase in Christianity, excellence, excellence, excellence. And I remember having people in my life group who wouldn't let people in their homes because it wasn't excellent enough of an environment. And right, So there's a thin line between excellence and, and, and to where it becomes a prideful vanity kind of thing. And, and so we got to watch that, but, but we got to do things right. And, and so this morning, you know, service went off about 9.01, right? And, and it's like, you know, so... And, and things happen. There's nothing they can do. This morning's problem was just nothing they can do. But someone asked me once. They said, why is it such a big deal to you that we start on the exact minute? I said, well, you know, it's like this. I own a business, and we open for business at 8.30. Not 8.30-ish. We open at 8.30. And this is God's business. Am I going to handle this any less lightly than I would handle my own? I mean, come on, we got to think about it. Because we do things and we compromise excellence and we think that we're doing things right and it's just not showing diligence. I, I knew a man once who told me that he got burnt hiring about three or four Christian men who were, in his words, the laziest men he'd ever worked for him. He would never hire a Christian again. What an indictment, right? We, we ought to be the first. They ought to be like, 
lined up looking for, oh, you're a Christian? Even if they're not, you're the kind of person I want to hire. Isn't that right? You know, Bach signed all of his, all of his work, every piece uh, of music he ever produced. He signed it, Soli Deo Gloria, in Latin, glory to God alone. And so what if we figuratively signed our work over to the Lord, right? Because the Bible says, whatever you do, work at it as if working for the Lord, since you know you'll get a reward for him. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing anyway. But what if we really did it? You know, we were doing the the, um, remodel of this building back when we were in the bowling alley. And I just started coming to the church. And and so I was helping, and they were teaching me how to paint. We were in the fellowship hall, and, and there was... Uh, we painted that whole room, and we got rid of the windows now, but at that time there was windows, and there was a ledge at the top of the window that was about this high. And so everybody was trying to get out, and I needed to paint that ledge. And so I'm going under, and i got to scrape all the metal, and i got to paint it. And they're like, come on, man, no one can see that. And I didn't want to be like, you know, I'll look at me. So I didn't say it. I just said, hey, you guys go ahead. I'll get it. But in my mind, it's like God can see it. What do you mean no one can see it? We, we do things with excellence. We do things with right because we're working for the Lord, church. And, and so I was thinking about the song. I thought about this last night. Remember that song, Butterfly Kisses, by Bob Carlyle? And so now listen, listen to these lyrics. As I drop to my knees by her bed at night, she talks to Jesus and I close my eyes. And I thank God for all the joy in my life, but most of all for Butterfly Kisses after bedtime prayer. Let me ask you this. Do you think secular radio stations wanted to play that song on the radio? Did they approve of the message of that song? Come on, absolutely not, right? Some might not have objected, but a lot of them did, and yet it was played on every pop radio station in the country. Why? Because it was done with so much excellence that girls were having that song at their wedding for the daddy-daughter dance, and they're demanding that the radio station played it. Look, church, we can't just be average. We got to be better than average. We got to make them get to the point where they can't push us down. We're just too darn good. Come on, somebody. The church has got to raise the standard. Sole Deo Gloria, that's what we got to be. I'll tell you, the thing that this generation just cannot tolerate, this, this coming up generation, they, they, they can't handle us not being bold in our faith. Look, they don't even, uh, uh, they're, they're willing to listen to us stand for our convictions even if they don't agree. But what they're absolutely unwilling to listen to is wimpy Christianity. They're saying, are you going to stand up for this thing? Do you really believe it or not? I'll never forget we were at a leadership conference and Jim Collins spoke. Jim Collins isn't a Christian, but it was a Christian conference and he's a speaker. And he gets up there and he says to the crowd, he says, look, at the end of this, and he was just being sincere. He's just speaking from his heart. I'll never forget what he said. He said, if you really believe that Jesus Christ is the only hope for this world and eternal salvation, he said, you ought to give your entire life to promoting that message. Come on, he gets it. He's not even a believer. How how can we give anything less than our best to God? Lastly, if we're going to influence an unstable climate, then we got to let God defend us. And and so Daniel did that. Daniel had some friends, actually, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so there was a big statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. They were to bow down to the king. And so this is what they said when the king came and gave him one last opportunity. They said, King Nebuchadnezzar, listen to this, we don't even need to defend ourselves to you. I'm just summarizing. We don't even need to defend ourselves to you. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, how many of you know sometimes... Christians get martyred. They had no guarantee. Even if he doesn't, we will never bow down and serve you. Do you hear that? There's no compromise. God is their defense. Let it fall the way that it may. And they learned that from their friend Daniel, who was thrown into a lion's den and and responded the same way. Like Jesus, he never uttered a word in his defense. They wanted to set him free. The king, it was a new king, Darius, wanted to set him free. And I see Samson as someone who just returned evil for evil. There was a time when he found what the Bible says is foxes, the translation's more accurately jackals, and he tied their tails together with a torch to destroy all the Philistines' crops. Okay, now granted, they killed his wife, and and so some vengeance may have been due, but it was returning evil for evil is what it was. And, And so in the natural, look, it's easy to want to defend ourselves. Isn't that, isn't that the natural human response? Thank you. I was hoping somebody's with me. (laughs) Part of letting God 
defend us, church, is we got to be willing to overlook an offense, right? I can tell you this. I have no problem forgiving somebody in the world. That's no big deal to me. When I was in the world, I did infinitely worse. It's no big deal. If people wrong you, it's going to happen. Let it go. But you know what hurts? Come on, when your brothers or your sisters rise their heel to you. Come, come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? If you've walked with God for any amount of time, you've experienced this, right? And now we live in a day and age where they'll take their case to social media, right? And so it just, the natural thing is let's just respond. Let, let's let everybody see the true story, right? And But what is that kind of testimony is that to the world with Christians bickering with each other? We got to have the confidence that we're living the way that God has called us to live because you'll never be able to overlook an offense if you don't believe you're living right. But we got to have the confidence to know that God has our back, right? No weapon formed against us shall prosper, I was reminded in our prayer group today. God is better at defending you than you are. You defend yourself, you just begin to look guilty, don't you? Right? And then you get in this war of words, and it looks a lot like a white Bronco running from the police. <laughs> we are supposed to live above reproach. So Billy Graham had a message, and he had that message for 50, 60 years, same message over and over and over again. And his message was simply, there is no hope for humanity except through the cross of Jesus Christ, and you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior to be eternally secure. Do you think our media enjoyed that message? Do you think they approved that message? Come on. But did you ever hear, I didn't, maybe you have, did you ever hear one accusation against Billy Graham? You want to know why you didn't hear an accusation against Billy Graham? Because someone to make an accusation against Billy Graham would reflect poorly on the person making the accusation. He was what the Bible calls above reproach, and that's the way we are to live. Now, I want to wrap it up like this, okay? I, I know that, that as you hear this, and yeah, let's just forgive and move on, and it's easy. And No, I'm not saying it's easy, okay? And, and some of you have been betrayed in ways that, that are far beyond anything I've experienced. I, I was with a woman this week who, who shared with me that, that her husband years ago left her for her best friend. Okay, look, I don't have any trite answers for that. You know, she forgave him, but I, I don't know how I would be able to handle that. That's not just, oh, well, get over it. Okay, that's a really, really big deal, okay? But this is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, I, I think we must forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. And Jesus was even more direct. He said, if you will not forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Listen, Jesus didn't do things for shock value. He was just telling you this is the way that it is. And so as we're going to move forward in this series Right now, what I want to leave you with is you got bitterness and resentment in your heart, whether for someone in the world or for one of your brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to leave that in this room before you leave today, okay? And so I'm going to pray in a minute, and I'm just going to give you the opportunity to do that. Just in your heart, just let it go. Forgive him. You say, no, I've tried it so many. Try it again. And with God's help, you will be able to let it go. I know some things don't go away in a day, but God will bring you through the process, but you've got to be diligent and want it. Amen? All right, if you'd stand to your feet, I want to tell you about Wednesday. You heard about the youth being baptized. Man, I don't, I don't even know what our number is up to. Robert, seven, 11. 17, 27. Whole bunch of kids. <laughs> going to be baptized, 630, Wednesday, right there. We're going to line up right here because we're going to watch our video here. And, and I just, I'd love for you to come out. It's a three-week class starting this week. We'll watch the kids get baptized at 6.30. 7 o'clock, we'll have a one-hour class. No longer than one hour. Probably get out a little bit before that. Listen, hospitality is such an issue, church. We, we, listen, if we're going to make people feel welcome in our homes, in our church, then we got to understand what's going on in society. And this video is just awesome in doing that. Amen? If you need to forgive somebody, do it right now. Let's pray. Father, will you give us the ability to walk out of this place and represent you well to a very dark world. God, will you allow us to let our light shine into the darkest recesses of society, God, and be bold in doing it. And God, would you just provide your favor and your blessing. And God, set people free and do it all for your glory. And everybody said, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you have any questions or want more information, please visit us by going to our website at www.christian.life.